Okay. Uh, 12.02. All right. So I usually start two minutes past the hour. So welcome, everyone. Uh, and uh, so the meeting is being recorded, and uh, hopefully everything's working fine today, and you had no trouble uh, logging in. And this is the way uh, it's going to be, hopefully, from now on. Um, I've also noted, uh, put links for uh, the Zoom sessions for discussions that follow each lecture. Uh, and at the moment, they're at 9 p.m., so there'll be one at 9 p.m. today. And the, the link for that you should see at the same place uh, that you saw on the Canvas page uh, to get to this class. And I believe uh, Ryan has sent out an email trying to schedule a section time. Uh, probably will probably start next week. And again, the links for the section will appear in the same the same location. Okay, so now let me connect my iPad. Okay, so just to very quickly review what we did last time, uh, and then uh, happy to have any questions. So we uh, we said, well, we're going to consider many particle wave functions uh, of either uh, bosons, which are fully symmetric, or fermions that are anti-symmetric. And a, simple, a particular useful basis set for many particle wave functions is uh, uh, a product of single particle states. Uh, and for fermions, that product can be written as a Slater determinant uh, in terms of various states alpha one through alpha n uh, for n particles. And similarly in bosons, there's something called a permanent, which is like a determinant, except that uh, there's no uh, minus factors. Uh, and also there's no exclusion principle. You can put more than one boson in the same state. So given these wave functions, then you can ask, uh, what are the matrix elements of certain operators that you might meet uh, in in these wave functions? So you could have a one-body operator, uh, and this is and it turns out you know it's quite complicated to work out this matrix element, uh, but the final answer is extremely simple. Um, if the two states are identical, uh, then it looks like this, uh, and if the states differ by one particle, one state, of the state n alpha and l beta a particle moving from state beta to state alpha. Uh, let me try and put this over here. Um, then, uh, then you get a matrix element, uh, which is kind of complicated, but uh, this is what it ends up looking like for both fermions and bosons with some additional phase factors. So that's quite a mess already for the very simplest operator. Uh, but then you take a two body operator uh, and then you have to consider various cases uh, a typical, you most use most most common case is where uh, a particle goes from state gamma and state delta into state alpha and state beta. Two, so two particles change states, and then you get uh, this horrible, complicated-looking expression. All right. So now the method of second quantization is introduced to get around these comp to never have to evaluate those complicated matrix elements. That's really all it is. Uh, but of course, it leads to many other interesting ways of talking about many body physics. Uh, so, so we uh, introduce these operators, uh, the creation and annihilation operators uh, for fermions and bosons, uh, and they're very simple to state. So, for fermions, there's only if, let's imagine you had only one single particle state. Uh, then there's only two states available to you. Uh, there's the empty state, which we just say zero. So this is this is not a state that exists in uh, first quantized quantum mechanics, but this is the main innovation here. You, the vacuum itself is a state. And then you have a state with one particle in this particular state, one. So then you introduce an operator, basically uh, the creation operator, which takes you from a, uh, a dagger to this way, and the annihilation operator that takes you down this way. Uh, so there's only two states, and I showed that uh, what the, these states then obey uh, an anti-commutation relation, A dagger A is the same as the unit operator. And for bosons, you have an infinite number of possible states, even for one single particle states, uh, because you can have uh, zero bosons, one boson, two boson, and so on. And, and now the 
now you notice that this uh, this structure has some similarity to the structure of a harmonic oscillator. And in now the creation and annihilation operators here are very much the same as the ladder operators of a harmonic oscillator in exactly the same way a dagger takes you up and a takes you down. Uh, and now the relation between them is has a minus sign. Okay. So for, for a general boson like say helium or uh, this is some fictitious oscillator. It doesn't have much meaning other than a way of thinking about the many particle Fox space. But for a photon, this is literally, you know, photons literally are uh, occupation numbers in an oscillator, uh, which is the electromagnetic field in a cavity. Uh, so those are all harmonic oscillators and each photon is literally is exactly uh, you know, when you say you're in the second excited state of a harmonic oscillator, what you're really saying is that you have two photons in that state. Uh, and phonons, which are lattice vibrations, are very similarly. Uh, the, the, this oscillator is not fictitious at all. It's, it's completely real. Okay. Uh, so that's for a single particle uh, state, one, just one state. But if you have many other states, uh, you introduce creation and annihilation operators for each state. Uh, call them A alpha and A dagger alpha. Uh, and and then when you when they act on some many particle state, so the A alpha will annihilate this N alpha to go down to N alpha minus one. Uh, but then you also pick up this phase factor for fermions that you have to keep track of. Basically, A alpha has to go through all the other particles uh, that are present before it. And each time it goes through it, you pick up a minus sign because it's a Fermi statistics. So that's what this zeta counts. Uh, or zeta is minus one for fermions and plus one for bosons. And then from this definition, then uh, you can deduce these relations uh, where A and A dagger either commute or anti commute. And also for both fermions and bosons, uh, the number operator, the number of particles in a given state is A dagger A, just like it is for the harmonic oscillator. And it's easy to show that's also the case for fermions. All right. Any Questions on that? Okay, so then proceeding, uh, we can now, well, I guess I discussed this last time, uh, we can now write down uh, the old operators uh, in a very simple form. So, oh, but before we get to that, uh, note that, you know, up to a normalization factor, the general, most general state now uh, can be built out of just starting with the vacuum state and just adding particles, uh, n1 particles to state one, n2 particles to state two, and so on. All right, so now we have these operators which are unphysical because they're just willy nilly annihilating and creating particles. That doesn't happen in the real world. Uh, but we can use them as building blocks to construct physical operators. So we have this operator V. Uh, way back here, the one body operator, um, this one, uh, which whose matrix elements we worked out laboriously uh, in terms of the, the permanence of the determinants. And we got some answer. And, and now my claim is, uh, which I really won't go through the proof, the books go through it, uh, and you can check it, uh, that the the operator in terms of annihilation and creation operators is this one. So you annihilate the particle state beta when acting on any state, you pick up this matrix element, which is just a complex number, and then you put a particle in, in state alpha. This is all you need to know. And, and you write your most general state in this form. So then working out the matrix element of this object in terms of this state just becomes an exercise in using these relations over and over and over again. You just use those and you get a matrix element. Uh, and just from these uh, defining operator relations, uh, you can work out the matrix element of this operator between any single, any many particle state. And the claim is you get the same numbers that you got by the laborious calculation uh, using uh, determinants of permanence, okay. All right, so, and it's not so hard to work out. It's kind of tedious and I urge you to read the proof of this in any book uh, you like to see. Okay, at least for the one body operator, it's not too bad. And, okay. Uh, 
So now we can, however, there's a, there's some tricks to building up higher body operators, which are which you're going to use. So we introduce uh, 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 what's called the field operator psi of x. So you have some single particle basis, which you call alpha, the state's labeled by alpha, and, and u alpha is the wave function. And uh, so you make the, you take the sum of alpha, u alpha, a alpha. Okay, so this is an operator. This is just a complex number now. Now, psi of x is not to be confused by as a wave function. It's not a wave function or anything. It's just another operator. Uh, and by the completeness of the u alpha, you can see you can invert from a alpha to psi alpha. So what is psi of x? Well, psi of x is essentially the annihilation operator in the position basis. Uh, because, uh, well, let's see. Uh, how do we see that? Well, I mean, uh, you just play around with basis changes uh, from the state alpha to the wave function being delta uh, of x minus x, where x would be the, the label of the state. Uh, so this psi of x is just basically uh, an operator that annihilates a particle at position x. Uh, just like A alpha was an operator that annihilated a particle state U alpha of x. Now, knowing the commutation relations uh, of the A alpha, which are right here, uh, these commutations are anti-commutation relations, uh, you can work out the commutation relation of psi, and, and that turns out to be, instead of being a delta alpha beta, it's a delta of x minus x prime, so direct delta function. And the difference is here, now the states are labeled by continuous index, which is just the position. Uh, and so that's why you get a direct rather than a chronic adult. And this is another useful symbol. This this just means uh, if this is a plus one, it's a and it's a commutator. If it's a minus one, then it's an anti-commutator. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So now the number operator, we said the number of, of uh, particles in the state alpha is a dagger a. Uh, and you sum over all states, that's, that's the total number of particles. Uh, and now you use this, uh, this decomposition here, insert it in here, and then do the integral over uh, sum over alpha uh, uh, and use the completeness, I thought completeness relation of the U alpha and you'll get this is just the integral of psi dagger x psi of x. So, so that tells us just by looking at this, that this object here is what you call the density operator, uh, the density of particles at the position X, because the integral of it gives you the total number of particles. Uh, another way to say this is you can write the density operator in first quantized form as just a sum of delta functions over at all the uh, positions of all the particles. Uh, and then use the rule to write this in the alpha basis uh, by taking matrix elements of this. Uh, this is just uh, applying this rule here. Uh, and that, but that's a simple matrix element that you can evaluate. Uh, and now you can see that this object here, uh, using this uh, relation here, uh, or that one, uh, is nothing but psi dagger psi. So there's the density operator. In terms of the field operator, it's just psi dagger psi. And this is a very useful operator uh, because with this operator, you can build up lots of other operators. And we're going to see, of course, a uh, lot more of this density operator. Uh, so in fact, if I, all I knew was this, I can even go back and derive the other relations. So for example, I had the one body operator, uh, this one, I can write it as, uh, you know, dx, bx times this, oper this uh, still in the first quantized form. And then I have no, I just told you that this thing in the first, uh, in the, uh, is just the density operator. In the second quantized form, it's psi dagger psi. So I plug that back in here. And now I go to the other basis and lo and behold, I, I get the answer that I claimed for any operator V. Okay, so this is really the simpler derivation. Uh, books have very much more complicated derivation. This is probably the easiest way to derive it. And now this works for uh, uh, 
the two body operator. You know, we have this horrible complexity we already spoke about before, but no worries here. Just write it in terms of the density operator and be careful about ordering of various uh, operators. So this is the original two body operator. Uh, there's an I not equal to J, as I mentioned last time. So now what we do is we subtract, remove that and subtract uh, the diagonal components R, R. Once we remove it, we can write it in terms of the density operator, because if you just put in the expression for the density operator in terms of delta function and integrate it over X and Y, you'll get back this. So this becomes W of X, Y, rho of X, rho of Y. And here it's W of X, X times rho of X, okay. But we know what the density operator in the second quantized form, which is psi dagger psi. So you do that for rho of x and rho of y, and also over here. Uh, and then you know the key thing is you have to remember uh, that everything has to uh, you remember the ordering of the operator. These operators don't commute with each other. Um, so this is psi of x, psi dagger of x, psi of x, psi dagger of y, psi of y. And what we always do when playing with these operators is we normal order them. That is, you put the uh, daggers on the left and the uh, undaggers on the right. So now we have to interchange these two. Okay, so when you interchange these two, uh, then you're going to pick up a delta function for both fermions or bosons. Uh, and it turns out that when you put in a delta function for these two, and then do the integral over y, that's just what's needed to cancel this term out. So this annoying second term disappears. Uh, and then you pick up either a plus or a minus sign, depending on your bosons or fermions in terms of psi dagger, psi dagger, psi, psi. Uh, but then you go one more step where you write it in this way. And so this is good to remember. Uh, it's psi dagger of x, psi dagger of y, and this is the conjugate, so it comes in the opposite order. So it's x, y, y, x. Uh, and now it's normal ordered and also in the conventional ordering of the operators, uh, where this is the conjugate of that. Uh, and now it doesn't matter. This is always correct, whether for fermions or bosons. So this is the very general expression, extremely simple uh, for any two body operator. And, and now you can rewrite it in any basis you want. Uh, and if you write it in the alpha beta basis, this is the expression, extremely simple, very general expression, uh, where this alpha beta uh, KL is this matrix element. Uh, and again, remember uh, the convention. So here, state alpha uh, is at position X. So then on the right-hand side, uh, it's the first state here, the K, uh, that's going to be at X. Uh, that's the way I've chosen to write it. Uh, but state K notice appears at the end, and this here appears at the. Uh, so the particle that was in state alpha goes into state uh, K. And the particle that was state in beta, which is the particle at position Y, uh, goes goes into L. So that's 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 the main ordering thing that you have to always remember what's going on here. How do I get rid of this? There we go. Okay. Uh, and, you know, as I showed you last time, you can write this in pictures, of course. Uh, so this is the first Feynman diagram, if you wish. There's some interaction uh, where state alpha uh, is going into state K and state beta or the other way around, sorry, state K is going to state alpha, you annihilate K, oh, excuse me. Oh, and state L is going to beta. So that's how you write it. Now, however, when you evaluate this process in any physical calculation, you'll find that you will of course have to consider both possibilities that if two particles coming in, uh, they can go out like this or they can exchange. And both possibilities are included uh, in the operator algebra and the operator commutation or anti-commutation relation would automatically give you the minus signs that you need to take care of both what's called the direct process and the exchange process. So this is, you know, 
this has both of them included, and as we'll see in a little more detail shortly. Uh, uh, and this is the very general expression for it. Okay, so that's my lightning introduction to the method of second quantization, uh, you know, which takes several chapters in some books. Uh, Ferdinand Velechka has, you know, really complicated discussion. Uh, but hopefully you've seen that if you just build up things from the density operator, you can just pretty much, once you understand the meaning of this operator, you can pretty much get anything you want from this. Okay, any questions? Sorry, that last oh. point that you made, um, were you just saying there that you're drawing the S diagram visually, but it's also like including the the case where the alpha and beta are switched, like the, the T diagram, is that the point you're making? Yeah, so this diagram just is just a picture for this, this matrix element, this particular uh, matrix element here. Uh, but when you're actually, you know, doing a calculation uh, for something, uh, when you this this will be a small piece of a bigger object. Uh, so, for example, you know, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Let me think about it. Uh, you know, you may have some some other stuff happening on the other side. Uh, you know, this particle coming in and interacting. Uh, and then this particle here, you know, uh, goes through a slit or inter interacts with something here, uh, and, and then it goes along. So this is some some probe that you're adding to the system, and this particle is uh, also interacts with some probes and goes along. So when you're doing the computation, the rules for Feynman diagram, which you will learn later, uh, will tell you that you have to include this diagram, but you also have to include this diagram. So that'll, you know, when you actually do a computation of physical process, both those diagrams will appear. Uh, and the, the matrix elements for those two processes, the direct and the exchange process, uh, will automatically come out correctly uh, just by using the, uh, you know, by just changing labels and, uh, and understanding what happens when you change the orderings of AL and AK and so on. Gotcha, okay. thank you. This, this is a, we'll of course going to see this in much more detail just to give you a flavor. And you'll see it very shortly now in the first calculation we're going to do with this, uh, with this approach, how the two processes appear. Any other questions? All right, so let me now do uh, famous Hartree-Fock theory, uh, which is a variational way uh, for, for dealing with a many party problem. Uh, I think this was invented in the late 30s, and it really was one of the first physics problems that was that computers were used for to solve what I will describe now in the Hartree-Fock equations uh, in 30s and 40s. Uh, and it's gone through, you know, lots of evolution. It eventually now has become a very, uh, uh, with some corrections, something we call density functional theory, which is highly successful in many materials. Uh, for reasons that are a bit mysterious, but also sometimes it doesn't work. And, uh, you know, so our, our, our hope is here, you know, that what we want to develop is some intuition for what is the physics of Hartree-Fock theory. Uh, and towards the second part of the course, we'll start talking about systems where it doesn't quite work. But what are the basic equations? So the, the idea is in principle, extremely simple. And in fact, uh, I'm first going to do it in the first quantized way of doing things. I won't even use operators. And then I'll show you how it's done with the operators uh, much more simply. Uh, let's see, I'm not seeing the time here. Okay, there's the time. All right, so we take, just take a Hamiltonian like this. Uh, I, you can add a potential if you want, which uh, one body term, but I haven't, okay. So you have some kinetic energy uh, of a bunch of particles, h bar squared over 2m, and some potential between them, which I'm now calling v. All right, so now I want to find uh, uh, its ground state. Uh, it's not just its ground state, but let's just start with the ground state first, and maybe some excited states too. Uh, and I'm going to say you know, um, that I'm going to make an assumption that I can write the ground state 
uh, as a state determinant. That is, there's, there is some set of states, single particle states, uh, and what's going to happen is that I'm going to occupy n of them because I have n particles in the ground state. Okay, so what is my variational parameter? My variational parameter is in fact all of these states. So this is like a variational, it's more like the calculus of variation. I have an infinite number of parameters. The single particle wave function phi alpha of r, which are constrained of course to be orthonormal to each other, uh, are themselves the variational parameter. Or another way to put it, I imagine that there's some fictitious potential, single particle potential, you know, could be a harmonic oscillator, it could be a nonlinear oscillator, it could be anything. And in that potential, I get some states, uh, phi alpha of r, uh, which are all orthonormal. Uh, and then I make a slightly determinant of this state. So my variational, the thing I'm free to choose is that potential. There's some single particle potential I want to choose. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you what that is. I don't know what it is. So I have to sit down and do some work to figure out what is the best possible potential whose single particle states will give me the best many body states. So that's the question that Hartree-Fock theory asks. And it gives you a set of equations that you'd solve on a computer for the best potential and the best corresponding eigenfunctions. So how does it work? All right, so for now, we just think of phi alpha as unknown and we make a slater determinant. And then we go ahead and evaluate the expectation value of psi, of h, sorry, uh, by the rules that we have just given. Uh, and what would you get? Well, uh, the kinetic energy will be just the sum of the kinetic energies uh, in every one of these states, phi alpha. That's a one body operator. Uh, and in the two body operator, if you go ahead and evaluate this, uh, you get two terms. Uh, and this relates just to the discussion we just had. So the first term is what's called the direct term, uh, where it has a very simple interpretation in this particular, that you have two particles. So imagine particle one is in state alpha and particle two is in state beta. And so the mod squared is the probability that particle one in state alpha is at position R1. Uh, and phi beta squared is the probability that particle in state beta, beta is at position R2. And you just multiply the potential by the probabilities and you integrate over all possible positions. So that's basically the very natural probabilistic, if you just take the probabilistic interpretation of the wave function, that's a very natural thing to write down. Uh, and this particular term appears uh, in evaluating this matrix element. So basically what I'm saying is here is if you go through this exercise with all these determinants. Uh, and, you know, I just showed you what the expression was, but now the alpha, beta, and the gamma, delta are basically uh, the same set of states. Um, and so you have to go in and work all this out, uh, looking at the expectation value in this later determinant. I'm not going to do it because as we'll see, there's a better way to do all this using operators in a few minutes. Uh, and so you get two terms, the direct term I've just uh, described. And you also get with a negative sign, what's called the exchange term, okay? Uh, so maybe if I again draw a picture here, well, first let me describe the structure of the exchange term. So this exchange term is really crucial uh, it's it's the reason uh, that magnets exist. <laughs> it's, it's, it's because of the exchange term that we have ferromagnetism. Uh, so what is, what's happening here? So if you want to think about, you have a particle R1, first particle state beta in the initial state. Uh, and here the first particle, or the second particle state alpha. But in the final state, they've exchanged position. So particle R1 went from state beta to alpha and particle R2 went from state alpha to beta. So they, so in this state, they came in and just stayed in their own state and you just looked at the probability. Uh, and in this uh, contribution, they, they crossed each other. They exchanged positions. Okay. Uh, and another interesting thing to notice is that, you know, this, this is a highly non-classical type of term. It has no probabilistic interpretation. It even comes with a negative sign. Uh, 
And this term is usually very, very small because suppose, suppose they state alpha and beta, they were far apart from each other. Phi alpha was here and phi beta was here. Then what you'll see is that this thing is practically zero because if R1 is over here, well, R1 is in state alpha. So imagine my first particle is sitting in state alpha. So on this side, I get the wave function uh, at R1. But then here I get phi beta of R1. That means I get at the same position R1, my first particle sitting here, I get the wave function of the other state. And that's extremely small over here if they're far apart. So classically, this type of contribution would be, well, or if when particles are well separated, meaning they're looking like classical particles, this, this contribution is exponentially small. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really a, so, so it's only important when the wave function, the two particles actually overlap, both particles in the same place at the same time. Uh, then this term becomes larger. Okay, and as we'll see in the, in fact, I think the next second chapter or third chapter, that this is the term responsible once you put spin in uh, for, 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 for ferromagnetism. So really crucial. All right, but what, what do we have now? So now we have expectation will have the energy, and I can think of this energy as, you know, so this I'll call E0. So E0 is a functional. It's a functional of all possible functions phi alpha of r. So you give me some phi alpha of r, uh, I can evaluate this functional. Uh, just to, I put my computer and I evaluate this uh, this whole object here. I know the potential, I know the mass of the particle, I go ahead and evaluate this. Okay, so now the variation principle state minimize this. So pick your phi alpha, figure out what the phi alpha are uh, and minimize this. So you have to take uh, the variational derivative of this functional with respect to all the phi alpha. Okay, uh, so there's, you can go ahead and do that, but uh, there's one uh, important thing to keep track of, which I guess is not explained here, which I have to mention. Uh, you have to do the constraint uh, while maintaining the constraint that these are, while maintaining that these are orthonormal functions, dr, phi alpha star of r, phi beta of r, is delta alpha beta. So it's really a constrained minimization. You have n functions, phi alpha of r, and you want to minimize the functional subject to the constraint that they remain orthonormal to each other. So the way you did, uh, do constraint minimization uh, is by Lagrange multipliers. So you have to have, here you have n squared constraint, if you have n particles, so you need n squared Lagrange multipliers. Turns out you don't need all of them. Uh, the, the equations have uh, very nice properties that you don't need to impose all the constraints. They are, turn out to be automatically satisfied because it'll turn out these phi alpha are eigenfunctions of some emission operator. Uh, so what the only thing you need to keep track of in the end uh, is, the, uh, is the normalization. So you only need the diagonal constraint. So you need only n, uh, Lagrange or Lagrange multipliers. All right, so so you, uh, you and those Lagrange multipliers is what we call EHF. So this is the the Lagrange multiplier for constraint from the constraint from normalization constraint. It turns out to have the dimensions of energy, uh, and it's a very useful object. We're going to say a lot of this Hartree-Fock energy. Um, it's not the total energy. Uh, as we'll see in a bit, it's the quasi-particle energy. Okay, so you uh, you take the variational derivative of this mess uh, with this constraint, uh, and you get an equation. And here's the equation. This is what it looks like. Uh, it looks like a Schr Schrodinger equation, uh, but uh, but a little more complicated than a normal Schrodinger equation. So this is so this first term is just like a Schrodinger equation. You have some potential v 
which is called VH, that's the heart tree potential. Uh, and then there's another potential we call VF, that's the FOC potential, uh, which uh, is a non-local potential. In other words, phi alpha is your wave function uh, and it involves an integral over uh, the position of the wave function over many, uh, many positions R1. Okay, so it's, a, it's like a non-local operator uh, where, where the kind we haven't really met before in undergraduate quantum mechanics anyway. Uh, but anyway, so this is what appears from the equations. Uh, and Vf and Vh are expressions you can write down. Now, what makes these things complicated is that the potentials themselves, v, the, the Hartree potential and the Fock potential, uh, depend upon the wave functions. So these are sometimes called nonlinear Schrodinger equations. Uh, you know, from come from minimization of the many body problem. Uh, you have to solve a Schrodinger equation in some potential, VH and VF. One is local, the other is non local. If this was a delta function here, the, the, this would reduce to that. Okay, so this is a generalized Schrodinger equation with a non local potential. Uh, and so, how, do, how does the, the numerically, how does this work? Well, you guess, you pick a potential VH and you pick a potential VF, something you cook, up, uh, you cook up something reasonable. You solve this equation, you find all its eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. So the eigenvalues, uh, this will of course depend on alpha here now. Uh, I should have put a dependence on alpha. This, the Hartree-Fock energy depends on the state you're talking about. Uh, well, no, it's not there here. Okay, uh, so you pick a potential, you find the phi alpha just by solving the Schrodinger equation, which I presume your, your computer knows how to do very rapidly. Then knowing the phi alpha, you compute the potential from these two equations, from the Hartree potential and the Fock potential, uh, and you get some other potential. So then you, uh, so you got phi alpha, you get the potentials. Uh, we go this way. And then you got the potential, you go back and put it back in here. So you keep circulating, iterating. You've, uh, and of course, many clever computer algorithms have been worked out to do this very rapidly. Uh, and eventually you converge. So you pick a potential, you find a wave function from the wave function, you get the potential and go on. So this is how you end up, this is the kind of nonlinear potential equation you have to solve. Uh, and today, you know, this can be done in the blink of an eye with good computer algorithms. Uh, and uh, these things converge usually pretty well uh, for most reasonable potentials, you know. Uh, okay. So that's, these are the famous hartree fock equations uh, that, uh, that you have to solve. And in general, this is a numerically demanding task. Uh, we will see in some cases that we're going to consider that you can solve them exactly, these equations, uh, and, and then uh, then life becomes a bit simpler. But in general, it's not so easy. Uh, all right, oh, oh yeah, one final thing I forgot to mention. So what are these Hartree and the Fock potentials? Well, the Hartree potential, uh, of course, has a very simple interpretation. It's connected, of course, to the direct term. So this is what I call the direct term with the probability. Uh, and so this thing also makes a lot of sense. This is some potential that particle one experiences. And what is the potential that particle one experiences? Well, you take any other particle, assume it's in state beta. So the probability, so that particle is somewhere else. Uh, and the probability is that position R1 is phi beta squared. Uh, and then the, there's an interaction between the two particles, which is V of R minus R1. Uh, and that creates the potential here. So basically the V Hartree uh, is just the potential this particle experiences um, averaged over the position of all the other particles. So this particle is repelling with the other particles. All you need to know is the wave function of the other particles and, multi and compute the probability they're here and that gives you the, the contribution uh, of that particle interacting here. So it's a, you know, very general average type term that you would 
can imagine you could have just almost guess. Uh, but the other one is more complicated, of course, and that comes from the exchange term. So there's no simple classical ex explanation uh, other than the fact that uh, these, the fact these are identical particles uh, and you can't tell which is which. So if you have two particles interacting, you have to allow for the fact that particle one can exchange with particle two and uh, you wouldn't be able to tell. So you have to consider both possibilities in quantum mechanics. Uh, and that gives you this uh, additional non-local FOC potential. Uh, I guess, you know, this is even in complicated problems, like when you're doing atomic structure, uh, you know, uh, these Fock terms are generally not as important as Hartree terms. Uh, so, in fact, I guess as the name, <laughs> Mr. Hartree uh, was someone who actually sat down and solved these equations and worked out the periodic table, you know, I don't know when. Uh, you just take the, start with hydrogen, helium, and you just build up and solve these equations for n particles, and you do a pretty good job just from the Hartree potential on a computer of getting most of the periodic table. Uh, I imagine once you get into the transition metals and the rare earths, then you do have to worry about the uh, the Fock terms quite a lot uh, because magnetism is much more important there. Okay. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it's reasonably accurate, of course, Keep in mind, this is a variational calculation. Um, okay. So let me already mention this here, uh, which will become clear in the subsequent discussion. Uh, what is this E? What is this Lagrange? What is this energy eigenvalue? Uh, well, what the energy eigenvalue is tell you something about uh, the excited state. So you've got, you found a ground state. Now, what you can do is you can, uh, and that ground state has some potential, Hartree and Fock potential, and has an infinite set of actually eigenstates, phi alpha, because this Schrodinger equation has an infinite set of eigenstates. So naturally, to minimize the energy, you occupy the lowest set of those. Uh, but then you have some occupied state and an empty states. So what you can do is you suppose you add another particle. You add a particle in an unoccupied state alpha, how much energy does it cost? Well, that turns out to be this number here. Or if you remove a particle, uh, how much energy that does that uh, cost? It's the negative of this uh, E R T fog. So the E R T fog is the excitation energy for single particle or single hole excitation. And that will become much more explicit uh, from the uh, second quantized formalism. All right, any questions? So, and I deliberately didn't, you know, there are messy calculations uh, that I didn't go through. One is to evaluate this thing uh, and get this on the right hand side. Uh, the second part, taking the variational derivative is not too bad. If you've ever done, learned a little bit of the calculus of variation, uh, you can quite easily see how you go from that to this uh, hartree fock equation. Um, you know, just take the derivative with respect to, you can just almost see it. If you take the derivative with respect to this term, you get phi alpha star left over uh, and the phi beta squared. And if you just look at it, um, you will get exactly exactly this Hartree term, this times that. And the other one, uh, you know, take the derivative with respect to this, 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 and you'll see um, along with the factor of one half and collecting everything, you get uh, this term. And then the constraint equations with the Lagrange multiplier will give you this on the right hand side. Okay, and 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 in fact, the reason you don't have to worry about the off diagonal constraint that they have to be orthogonal to each other uh, is if if you look at this equation for any v h and v f, this equation has certain hermeticity properties, and but with the theory of differential equation, you can. You can show that the eigenfunctions of this equation are always orthonormal, or at least orthogonal. Uh, the normalization is, of course, up to you, and that's why you do have to worry about the normalization constraint in uh, by imposing this Lagrange multiplier. Uh, so that so the off-diagonal constraints are automatically taken care of. So don't even bother imposing them. Any questions? Um, so we have. Yeah. If you assume like the potential is periodic, is there any extra information we can get out of it? 
Yeah, uh, I mean, these are very general equations. Then if the potential is periodic, sorry, right now there's no potential here, I only have an interaction. Okay, so this this system is actually translation invariant. Uh, but you, you are, I imagine you're asking, suppose I add another potential like this, U sum of I, some U of Ri, some single particle term like this. Uh, that's I didn't bother writing it, but if you added such a term, uh, you can see it doesn't change very much. It'll just have you'll just put a u of r over here. That's all. So there'll be two contributions. So this u of r now is a known function, some external potential. All right. So now I think your question is, what happens if u of r is periodic? Uh, well, yeah. Well, then um, you know that will be, I end up being that the Hartree-Fock potentials are also periodic functions and you have to apply block theorem and but the equations won't change it's basically it will help you solve these equations more rapidly on the computer that's all but the basic equations will remain the same so we can impose symmetries of course if we want to impose all the symmetries that we want in the solution of these horribly complicated set of equations if you have some symmetries like periodicity you just impose them to help you uh, converge to the solution faster. And sometimes you may want to break that symmetry. Uh, and of course, that's what our next few chapters are going to be about. Okay. Um, all right. So now, the same thing in operator formalism. Okay. So, uh, so that variational calculation, which you know we did laboriously uh, and very carefully, uh, is equivalent to something I can do kind of sloppily uh, using operators. So let me take a very general Hamiltonian uh, of this form, and the Hamiltonian has some one-body term uh, and uh, and a two-body term. Okay. Now there's all kinds of indices here and coefficients that depend on all the indices. I just drop them just for simplicity. Okay. You can put, you can dress them with alphas and betas and so on. Uh, and just keep, they go through all the equations. Uh, each one of the operators has some indices. There's some prefactors that depend on the indices and they just carry through the equations. I just don't write them out because it's, you want to strip it down to the basics of what we're doing. Okay, so here's our Hamiltonian. Uh, and the, the problem with this Hamiltonian is it's got this interaction term. It's got these terms that involve four uh, creation and annihilation operators. And that's a problem because we don't, that's very hard to solve. It's a many body problem. If I had only terms like this, that's a one body problem. Uh, it reduces to some Schrodinger equation that I can solve. So what I want to do is write my uh, Hamiltonian uh, as a, as some effective, some mean field, as we say, some mean field or effective average one body problem. So this is my exact Hamiltonian. I'm going to approximate it. And how am I going to approximate it? Well, I'm just going to replace certain objects by the average value. Uh, and this is completely equivalent to the variational calculation I discussed earlier. So I have, so the, 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 the worrisome part is this one. So I just want to replace this quartic term by quadratic terms. So basically what I'm going to do, uh, is just replace these terms, some of the pairs of operators, like a dagger and an undagger, because those are the things that's going to have expectation value in the ground state by their average value. So basic, and, and, and which average values I take? Well, the rule is you take all possible ones. So for example, if I have this operator, I can replace C dagger F by the average value, and then I'm left with D dagger E, so there's one term. But I could do the opposite. I could replace D dagger E by the expectation value, and then I'm left with C dagger F. And then a third possibility is I can replace C dagger E by the average value. But now I just have to remember that comes with a minus sign. So these two terms turn out to be the Hartree terms, and this is the Fock term. Uh, and why does it come with a minus sign? Well, at least this is for fermions here. Uh, well, because you know you have to bring. You remember that 
uh, I would have to bring E through the D and bring it over here, and these will anti-commute. And so when I'm taking the expectation, I assume the operators are really uh, next to each other, or I'm exchanging the coordinate of the particles, which will go back to the original formulation. Uh, and so you get a minus C dagger E times D dagger F. Uh, and and then conversely, you can average of these two, and that gives you that. Okay, so now I have this is I've done what's called the mean field approximation. I've replaced the Hamiltonian, a quartic Hamiltonian by quadratic Hamiltonian by just replacing certain operators by the average value. Uh, and so these are just numbers. Uh, which I, for now, assume I know. And then my Hamiltonian is just A dagger B times some number times D dagger E and so on. So it's some kind of one body Hamiltonian. Uh, and uh, if you just work through it and think about it and stare at it long enough, uh, you can conclude that this Hamiltonian is in fact nothing but this Schrodinger equation in position space. It's, it's, it's exactly, the, um, the Hamiltonian, sorry, is the left-hand side. It's some operator that acts on the states. So given some, it's some operator which depends on the Hartree and the Falk potentials, uh, which acts on this wave function phi alpha. And that operator is exactly this operator in the operator language. It's A dagger B plus some number times D dagger E and so on. So so what is the, uh, what do we have to do? Well, we have to take linear combinations of all these operators to make them make it diagonal. So we wanted to write our uh, hartree falk Hamiltonian uh, in this form. And finding the correct linear combinations of the operators is the same as finding the right basis, which is the same as finding the eigenfunctions uh, of this left-hand side. So the in operator language, finding the eigenfunctions of this left-hand side is the same finding. Uh, I should have used a different symbol here. Uh, so let me call this script C or something. So my C alpha is some number times, uh, you know, B plus some number times E and so on. So it's some linear combination of all these operators. So on. Uh, so it's, that's for like finding that, you know, that's just the same as diagonalizing a matrix if you're thinking of diagonalizing the Hamiltonian in the matrix space. Uh, so you find the right basis, some set of C alpha which is some linear combination of the A, B, C, D, E, F. Uh, and uh, then the Hamiltonian is diagonal. And, and the, you know, what is the ground state of this Hamiltonian? That's very easy. So this just says if, if state alpha is occupied, I get the energy E alpha, because this is the number operator in state alpha. So therefore, if I want the lowest energy state, uh, I just pick, I just, occupy the lowest energy E alpha, E alpha as small as possible. Okay, so that's my Hartree-Falk wave function, my slater determinant written in operator language. Uh, and then having found uh, this wave function in this, I have to go back and evaluate uh, these expectation values here uh, in this state. And I circulate, okay. So, and that's exactly in operator language uh, in very compact notation, what I was doing here in the wave function language. So we're going to do a lot of this in the next few lectures. You're going to see examples of how this all works. And I'm not going to bother with wave functions. Uh, we're just going to see, we're just going to apply this rule. Okay. We're going to factorize the Hamiltonian uh, by just replacing various operators by the average values. And then we're going to diagonalize that Hamiltonian. Uh, and then we're going to go back and make sure that uh, the expectation that the expectation values are subconsistent. And you keep iterating until they are. Okay, iterate, all right. Uh, there's one, uh, another important point. But I think I'll leave that to next time. The next question you can ask is, what is the actual ground state energy in the operator language? And the first thought uh, that you have, and maybe uh, this would be a good thing to think about uh, for next lecture, uh, your first thought would be, 
that the ground state energy of the many body system, the He Hartree Fock, uh, is just the sum over the occupied state, the sum of the energy of E alpha of occupied state in the ground state. Uh, this is not true. We cannot, that's not correct. It would be true if there's a non interacting particles. Uh, but it's not true for interacting particles because there's kind of a double counting because E alpha in, in, includes the interaction of particle one with particle two. But then when you add particle two, you include that interaction again. So you have to make sure that you don't double count the interaction. And that's why this is not true. Um, and you can, well, you can read the notes or you can think about uh, how you get the actual Hartree-Fock energy. Uh, in the first quantized formulation, that wasn't an issue. Uh, we already had, had an expression for the energy. That's what we began with. This thing, there's no double counting uh, because you know there was a one half here that made sure that you were not double counting. Uh, but if you're doing the operator language, you know you've got you, you know you're doing it slightly differently, just replacing things by the average value, and you found some energies. Uh, and it's very tempting to just add them up to say that's the ground state energy of the uh, of the system, but it's not. There's a small the correction that we can work on. But I'll stop here because I'm out of time. Questions? Okay, great. So uh, so we're going to start our experiment with the discussion sessions tonight at 9 p.m. Uh, see how it goes. So, you know, the general format of that, first of all, it's uh, it's at 9 p.m. to benefit people who are in different time zones who can only, who only had the chance of watching the recorded lectures, but everyone's welcome to come. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to discuss anything about today's lectures or, or even things beyond it. Uh, and we'll see how it works at 9 p.m. I might change the time depending on how things go. All right. So see you tonight. Any questions? <laughs>